I'm going to tell you some things about the recent fusion experiment at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory's National Ignition Facility that were not quite right. Hi, my name is Stephen Crivet. I'm the publisher of New Energy Times. I'm going to show you a few examples of how the fusion ignition story played out among the public and in the news media. I'm going to show you some examples that include knowledgeable science commentators, television news correspondents, and the United States Secretary of Energy. All of them miscommunicated the science discovery, but it wasn't their fault. Some things they said were inaccurate, some were misleading, but this is crucial. None of them are fusion experts. I am convinced that they thought the information they received from fusion experts at the Livermore lab was accurate. Mm -hmm. But if the Secretary of Energy is giving the press conference, everyone I think is thinking that we finally can get out more energy than we put in, and that is the... Oh, and, and that has been the key, because That's for so key. long we've been trying for decades. It's been the holy grail, and I thought we would have reached that in the 80s. I'm going to take you to a press conference, uh, which is being led by the U.S. Energy Secretary, Jennifer Granholm. Uh, today, we're here to talk about fusion, combining two particles into one. Last week, at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California, Scientists at the National Ignition Facility achieved fusion ignition, and that is creating more energy from fusion reactions than the energy used to start the process. It's the first time it has ever been done in a laboratory, anywhere in the world. Simply put, this is one of the most impressive scientific feats of the 21st century. Researchers at Livermore and around the world have been working on this moment for more than 60 years. So what does this accomplishment do? Two things. First, it strengthens our national security because it opens a new realm for maintaining a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deter deterrent in an age where we do not have nuclear testing. And the second thing it does, of course, is that this milestone moves us one significant step closer to the possibility of zero carbon, abundant fusion energy powering our society. Granholm, advised by the fusion scientists, used the phrase more energy from fusion reactions than the energy used to start the process. Now, anybody who was not a fusion expert was certainly going to understand that exactly as Tyson did. It was what we've all been waiting for, a fusion experiment that produces more energy than it consumes. During the main part of the press conference, Granholm did not explain the phrase energy used to start the process. She did not explain that the net energy claim excluded the energy required to operate the device. And she did not disclose how much energy was required to operate the device. None of the speakers that followed her explained these facts in their formal statements. After the prepared segment of the press conference, speakers took questions from journalists. One of them asked how much power the entire device consumed. Kim Boodle, the director of the Livermore Lab, sort of disclosed that fact. It's really important uh, that we tell you uh, the facts and that we get them right uh, before we go public. So that's what we've been doing for a week. So you should probably stay there. <laughs> um, two quick questions. Uh, one, um, I know this uh, the, the 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 positive uh, net return is, is the important thing, but how much energy does it take? That we talk about the I guess the wall plug energy. How much wall plug energy did it take? So the laser requires about 300 megajoules of energy from the wall to drive two megajoules of laser energy, which drove three megajoules of fusion yield. Boodle said 300 megajoules were required. By then, many people had tuned out. In a statement published by the laboratory the following day, the lab didn't disclose that the energy gain did not include the energy required to operate the device, 
They didn't explain the specific amount of energy used by the device. The fact that the lab says on its website that the experiment draws 400 megajoules instead of 300 megajoules is actually a side issue. Boodle probably misspoke. So what were these fusion scientists talking about in this historic, holy grail, Kitty Hawk moment, net energy claim? They were comparing the laser energy sent to the fuel target with the fusion energy produced. Two megajoules going in, three megajoules coming out. That's what they disclosed during the press conference and in their written statement the following day. But during the press conference, they didn't volunteer. And in the written statement, they didn't provide the fact that the lasers required hundreds of megajoules from the electric grid. So was this experiment scientifically significant? Absolutely, yes. Excluding the power required to operate the device, this is the first time that a fusion reaction has produced more energy than that going into the fuel. But as you can see, the scientific gain is positive 1.5. The engineering gain is negative. 99.23 megajoules is enough energy to power one 100 watt light bulb for 8.3 hours. This is what laser fusion scientists have achieved in 60 years. The next aspect I want to discuss is what difference does this scientific milestone mean in real world results? In this recent experiment, which reached ignition, the overall system achieved a 99.2% energy loss. But let's go back to last year's result before ignition. In that experiment, the overall system achieved a 99.5% energy loss. So this is what ignition has done. It brought us a three-tenths of 1% closer to a device that makes net energy from fusion. My critics are going to say that, well, modern lasers are 20 times more efficient than the ones used in the National Ignition Facility. But even those new lasers wouldn't give us device net energy based on this result. Now, here's the next concern. You might have heard or read that the lab representatives claimed that the NIF experiment demonstrated a self-sustaining fusion reaction. Did you know that the fusion reaction lasted for 90 picoseconds? How they consider 90 picoseconds as self-sustaining is not something I know how to explain. Now, here's the third issue. You heard the NIF scientists say that this indicates the possibility of fusion as a limitless source of energy. This is complete nonsense. There are two required fuel components. The NIF device requires a 50-50 mixture of deuterium and tritium. Deuterium exists in seawater. It's abundant everywhere. Tritium does not exist in nature as a resource anywhere. In the US, tritium is produced by the Tennessee Valley Authority on behalf of the US government for nuclear weapons. They don't sell it commercially. All the commercial tritium in the world is produced from a small fleet of aging heavy water nuclear fission reactors. Most of them are in Canada. After 2060, those reactors will have reached the end of their life cycle, and Canada does not plan on replacing them. So what about artificially making tritium? Fusion scientists hope that magnetic confinement fusion reactors will be able to breed tritium from lithium. In nature, there are two stable forms of lithium, lithium-6 and lithium-7. Most of it is lithium-7. The problem is that lithium-7 won't work well to produce tritium. 
This is because of the way the nuclear reactions happen. The lithium-7 reaction has a much lower probability of occurring, and therefore the tritium yield is not going to be sufficient. So the percentage of lithium-6 has to be increased to be used for breeding. In other words, it has to be enriched. A legal, environmentally safe method to enrich lithium-6 from natural lithium does not exist. Even if a viable lithium-6 enrichment method was invented, even if a lithium-6 enrichment plant was built, the best tritium breeding experts in the world say there is no known method to breed tritium fast enough in a fusion reactor. It's of course possible that our brilliant scientists will figure out ways to solve all of these problems. But to claim that the fuel for nuclear fusion is abundant and unlimited is simply not true. All of the information I've just described about fuel comes from published peer-reviewed journals. For the references, please go to the articles I've written listed on the New Energy Times Fusion Fuel webpage. A few days ago, John Mecklin, the editor-in-chief of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, spoke with Rob Rosner. He's a former director of another DOE laboratory, Argonne National Laboratory. Mecklin asked Rosner about how the Livermore ignition story was put out to the news media, specifically in the context of electricity generation. Rosner said, it's basically bullshit. I think that about sums it up. I hope this has been informative and helpful. And despite the Livermore claims of net energy, self-sustaining reaction, limitless fuel supplies, I'm still optimistic that scientists someday will figure out a practical and effective way to produce clean nuclear energy. Thanks for watching.